Good morning, friends. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Winsboro, South Carolina. The Sunday morning message for March 27th, 2022. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit blown away that we've made it almost to April of 2022. I don't even know how we got in the 2020s. But anyhow, as time passes us by, something happens to all of us. We experience life's trials and tribulations, the troubles that just come with the landscape. And we wonder, is God really paying attention? Is he seeing us through? Well, most certainly he is. But sometimes we need some reassurance. And in the words that Jesus will speak today in John 16 to his own disciples on the eve of his death, I think we'll find some encouraging words for us. You see, Jesus today is going to show us how to turn sorrow into joy. Well, understanding that, we're going to look at John chapter 16, verses 16 and through the end of the passage, actually, to verse 33. But today we're going to start with verse 16, where Jesus tells the disciples, look, in a little while, you will no longer see me. Now, they've spent three years with him ministering. They feel like they're at the pinnacle of everything right now. I mean, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, it seems like everything's going so well. And now Jesus is saying, I'm leaving you. Remember, he started this entire upper room discourse by saying that he was going to lay down his life for us. He presented himself at the Lord's Supper as our Passover lamb and talks about his blood being a new covenant. He even says, look, I'm going away going back to heaven to prepare a place for you. So they're troubled in spirit as they hear all these things. And now Jesus says, in a little while, you're not going to see me. But then in a little while, you will see me. If anything, the confusion in the disciples' minds and hearts is really beginning to bug all of them. And in the middle of that, Jesus just has to say, look, life's sorrows will come, but you've got to understand, I have the power to turn sorrow into joy. By the time he gets to the end of the passage, he says this, Do you now believe, in verse 31, Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home, and you will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Well, as we look at these words of Jesus, we find some very interesting things, and in the passage we're going to look at in some verses before that, uh, that allow us to understand how to follow Jesus, the conqueror, and therefore be able to rise above all of the troubles that you and I will face each and every day. As followers of Jesus Christ, these promises extend all the way to us in 2022. And as we look forward to some troubling times that are going to get worse in front of us, we've got to carry these promises with us if we are going to make it through. Well, it was interesting in this past week, I had the opportunity to go back down to uh, Columbia International University and hear once again John Maxwell. He's been here for the last three years at a leadership summit, leadership conference, and he speaks to pastors. This year at the leadership summit, I wanted to especially hear what he had to say uh, to folks. Many of our community leaders were there as well. Shortest Chapel was just packed out. And I thought, what is this great man of God going to speak about? I mean, he's been a great mentor in my life as he has been in the lives of thousands of others. And what will he say during these troubling times? Surely he's going to give us some wonderful pinnacle of success that we can point ourselves toward so that we can understand how to be just like him. And you know what his topic was? This is what really astounded me because knowing I was going to preach on this this Sunday, here's what he dealt with. How to receive a return on failure. You know, he's got a book about how to fail forward, and all he talked about was failure. Gave us seven great points on how to take failure and turn it to a positive. And one of the things he pointed out is you're going to fail. It happens. It happens all the time. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to hit, you know, you're going to hit that brick wall. You're going to walk right into it. As a matter of fact, you just got to understand how to deal with that. You can't let it discourage you and destroy your vision, your future. Instead, you've got to understand how difficult circumstances may actually be a blessing in your life. He began by quoting actually someone else, M. Scott Peck, 
who you may have read that book a long time ago, and maybe in high school, The Road Less Traveled, he said the first three words of that book really say it all. You've got the book if you read the first three words, which are life is difficult. Jesus never promised us an easy life. Matter of fact, he's telling his disciples right here that you're actually going to be in trouble for following me. He's already told them earlier in the chapter that the world is going to hate you because it hates me. Congratulations, get on board this train and watch how some people will not like you just because you're my follower. Life is difficult. And becoming a follower of Jesus doesn't mean you're going to avoid difficult circumstances. We all are going to have them. The question is, what will you do with those circumstances when they come? Well, he goes on to say many things. He gave a beautiful, seven, like I said, seven-point message about this, but I loved this one. One of those points that to me really spoke is how he said, encourage others with your failures. Encourage others with your failures. This quote to me stood out. He said, if I want to impress you, I'll talk about my success. But if I want to impact you, I'll talk about my failures. Why is that? Because in failure, you find out the true character of someone. Do you fail and then quit? Think about how many times Henry Ford went bankrupt, for example. I mean, there are many, many other uh, examples. That Walt Disney is one of those <laughs> examples who, you know, it looks like they, they tried. They should have got the message after the third or fourth time they got fired or were uh, dismissed from a job or their, their company went bankrupt, but they kept coming back. They kept trying. And the true mark of a believer is one that comes back when he falls. Now, keep in mind, this is something Jesus is saying after he's already told Peter, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny that you know me three times. But when you're converted, when you get back up from that, strengthen your brethren. In other words, he's saying, you're going to fall. You're going to have these problems. But if you stick with me, you are going to be able to have a comeback. Now, understanding that, there's several things that Jesus says to speak to our sorrows. I'm just going to deal with six of them this morning, and hopefully these will help you with whatever you are dealing with in your life, your ministry, your family, your job, whatever it might be, and especially with your church family. As Jesus speaks to these sorrows, I want you to listen closely to his encouragement, not just for his disciples in the upper room or in the, in the garden, or just before he's arrested. Instead, I want you to listen to what he's saying to us today through his precious, holy word. First of all, believe in me. That may sound simple, but you know, sometimes when we are failing left and right, it's because we haven't believed in Jesus and acted upon that belief. You might remember back in chapter 14, Jesus speaking back to Philip, who was like, oh, look, show us the Father. And Jesus is like, I've been with you this whole time. I've already told you I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Come on, Philip. Uh, get a hold of yourself here. And he says, look, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? In verse 10. So by verse 11, he just says, believe me that I am in the Father and he is in me. Believe me. It's a simple request from the Lord Jesus that every one of us ought to be able to acknowledge. When the world seems to be threatening you and pushing you down and even making fun of you for believing in Jesus, that's when that belief is your bedrock. It's the place where you stand when everything else wants you to fall. You stand on that belief in Jesus and then you'll not only have a place to survive when the storm comes, but then you'll be able to move forward having placed your faith in the one who can see you through. Believe in me, Jesus says. Secondly, he points out that sorrows cannot be avoided. You know, a lot of us try to plan our life around avoiding trouble and staying out of trouble. Well, you know, trouble will chase you. It will find you. Have you noticed that? Look down in verse 20 of chapter 16. And Jesus points out something that I think all of us need to grasp. He says, truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn. Now, of course, we know that's true about the disciples. They're about to face the death of Jesus, their mentor and friend. Of course, they're going to weep and mourn over that. But guess what? That's something that's, that speaks to all of us even today. Friend, the time is coming. That loved one is going to pass away. Tragic circumstances are going to happen. You may have that 
terrible auto accident. Something's going to happen to wreck your life. It's the way life works. We live in a sinful world. These are the results of sin. So you will weep and mourn, he says, but the world will rejoice. <laughs> you will become sorrowful. You know, here he's saying, you know, not only will bad things happen to you, but your enemies will be glad. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Yes, we know the enemies of Christ were going to be rejoicing that he was crucified. Let's get him out of the way. But you know what? This principle continues to apply down through the centuries to the lives of believers. Those who've rejected Jesus do not want to see you make it. They don't want to see you succeed. They don't want to see you full of joy and, and, and you know, with a springing forth with a well that is just spewing Jesus out all over everybody. They do not like to see that. And secretly, they may not announce it publicly, but secretly, they will be clapping. They will be rejoicing when something goes wrong, when your business turns down, when you lose your job, when you go to the doctor and get the cancer diagnosis. Yeah, he's talked all this good talk. Now, let's see what happens when the, the dark horse comes to his house, you know. <laughs> let's see how his faith holds up now. You know, and people will be saying things like that behind your back or maybe even sometimes to your face. Sorrows will come and sometimes those who don't follow Jesus will actually be glad you're going through tough times. But watch what he says. Your sorrow will turn to joy. That's right. Your sorrow will turn to joy. He says when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she's given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been brought into the world. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy from you. So listen, disciples, you're about to have a hard time. But I can promise you the flip side of that is going to be joy that no one can take away. Believer, that same promise I think exists with us each and every day. When sorrows come into our life, as long as you believe in Jesus, his Holy Spirit is with you, right in your heart, walking with you, guiding you through these troubling times. There's going to be a time where on the flip side of all of this, the joy is going to be so overwhelming. You'll see God's big picture and you'll be able to rejoice through it. It's a pattern of life that Jesus has set forth for each and every one of us. So don't try to avoid the sorrows. They're coming. But understand, it is Jesus who will get you through those and turn those sorrows into joy. The third thing he says, which I think is a good, good piece of advice for us today, is well, what do you do when you're in the middle of all these sorrows? Well, you pray. Jesus was telling his disciples how to pray in his name. And this is what we do to take our troubles to the Lord. He said, look, in that day you will not ask me anything. Truly, I, I tell you, anything you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. Friend, what are you going through right now? And who are you talking to about it? Now, yes, the Bible says in a multitude of counselors there is wisdom. It's okay to talk to friends and family. Maybe you've got a good therapist or a pastor to talk to. I don't know. But tell you what, there's someone you'd better talk to each and every day about it. He's always on call. You don't have to set up an appointment you don't have to beat his door down or, or, or get through the layers of all the people that uh, you know, are out there, the receptionists and the secretaries and, and everyone else to get to him. No, no, no. Jesus is always on call for you. You can come boldly before the throne of grace in Jesus' name and talk to God about your problems. Go ahead. Dump them all on him. Share them with him. Talk them over. Talk about them as you read his word and speak that word back to him. These are, the, these are the times in which you communicating with God is probably the most important communication level for you to take. It's something that you don't want to miss out on. Your prayer life during your times of sorrow will not only settle you, but it'll allow you to gain perspective as the Holy Spirit begins to work in your heart piece by piece and helps get you through your trial. Number four, troubles will always come. 
But, Jesus says, the conqueror is with you. Now there in verses 31 through 33, we read some of this earlier. I want you to grasp this passage again. Do you now believe, he says, Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home. You'll leave me alone, yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be encouraged, I have conquered the world. That's the second time we've read this today in this message because I want you to get this across. Go back and read Romans chapter 8 again where Paul even talks about what can separate us from the love of Christ. Can all these things, persecution, nakedness, sword, famine, you know, none of this can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. Instead, we are the overcomers who have overcome the world. Now, I love a little quote that I want to share with you today from Dr. Tony Evans' study Bible on this particular passage of Scripture. He says, regardless of how the world beats you down, you have reason to live with bold faith. Why? Well, because Jesus is the sovereign king over the world, and he has defeated sin, Satan, and death. If you're a believer, your eternity is secure. And Jesus has the power to overrule your earthly circumstances. Now, knowing this truth and maintaining an intimate relationship with the Lord will radically change your perspective as you face whatever obstacles come your way. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us, my friends. The conqueror is always with us. That's why you can make a difference and you can see it through. Number five. I give you something else that you will have during this storm that's coming in your life. I give you peace, something we've already read that he says uh, he promises in this particular passage. But you know what? It reminds us of a time he's already spoken these words to his disciples in a previous passage. Remember back in John 14, verse number 27, where he says, I'm going to find it in a second. There's verse 26, 27. Peace I leave with you. Now, when Jesus said, I am leaving, the disciples probably thought, oh my goodness, that means you're disappearing. Uh, Everything about you is now gone because you are leaving. Well, Jesus says, I'm leaving something with you. You're not going to be able to understand it or describe it. Matter of fact, Paul describes it as a peace that transcends all understanding in Philippians. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give as the world gives, so don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. This is the kind of peace that allows you to boldly stand up against whatever you're facing. There is no fear in faith, we're told. And here he is telling his disciples, don't be fearful. I've got this. That's why I'm leaving you with something that the world won't understand. They won't understand how you're in the middle of a traumatic event in your life, and yet you seem to have peace. That's because I'm giving it to you. It's a gift, and every follower of Jesus Christ can have this peace. If you're struggling and you don't have it today, then it's because you haven't been giving enough of your own life back to Jesus so that his Holy Spirit can bring you that peace You've been trying to handle this on your own. You're trying to work out all the details. You're trying to make things happen instead of letting God have the rule in your life. Oh, friends, give it up. Hand it over to Jesus. Surrender it today. Lay all those concerns at the foot of the cross, and what he's going to give you in return is is a peace that transcends all understanding. And then finally, One of the things that Jesus says to speak to our sorrows is to be courageous. Be courageous. We read that verse just now in verse 33 that really gives us that picture. But, you know, most of us just aren't the kind of folks that want to get at the the tip of the spear, so to speak. We're not going to be the ones leading the charge. It's hard to be courageous these days, especially if you're just naturally a follower instead of a leader. Well, this be courageous isn't just for leaders. It's for those of us who are followers as well. 
In other words, you can be following someone else's leadership, like the, a, a pastor at your local church. You can be following the leadership of, of your boss at work. You can be following good godly leadership. But you know, good leaders can't go anywhere with their army unless their followers are courageous and willing to follow, willing to go into the very teeth of the battle. I've been watching a lot of sports events here lately, and it's just amazing to see how a team comes together, perhaps behind their coach or their captain, and to see the things they can accomplish when they work together. It takes that courageous spirit to make that happen. Well, what about you, my friends? Are you courageous, which means you're ready to challenge the, the, the difficulties of the world, challenge the status quo, step up when you're called upon, sometimes to make a difficult sacrifice, to step up and do your part. That's what being courageous is all about. And I want to close by giving you an example of how someone could make a tremendous impact by just doing something that's right at the time that perhaps no one else would have even thought about, that no one else would have even considered they would have thought, hey, it's taking away from you. Why would you do that? But it's a person stepping up to make a difference, being courageous with an act of grace that I think really changed many, many lives. Now, what am I talking about? I want to show you one picture as we close today. It's a very typical picture from a fall football game. It's homecoming night. And as you would look at that picture, you wouldn't think anything unusual. You can probably figure out from the guy over here with the cowboy hat, it's probably at a Texas high school football game. What you need to know, though, are the circumstances of this picture. You see, you might think that the girl over here with the crown on her head is the homecoming queen. The fact is, it's this young lady over here that was elected homecoming queen. But something happened. She took the crown off of her own head and placed it on the head of this young lady. Why did she do that? Because the very morning of the homecoming event, that young lady's mother died, lost her long bout with cancer, and passed away. She showed up with her dad that night because they agreed that something that mom wanted them to do. And mom had said, don't you miss that because of what's going on with me. So she showed up in the midst of all of her sorrow and her pain to march in that homecoming uh, for her high school, even though by then she probably already knew she was not going to be the homecoming queen, but she wanted to be there because that's what she was supposed to do. It would even make her mom happy. This young lady did the most gracious, wonderful thing I can ever imagine, and I, I'm wondering even what, what drew her to, to do this, this act of grace at that time, when she took the crown off of her own head and put it on her friend's head instead and said, hey, listen, you've made the greatest sacrifice this morning. You've lost your own mom, and I'm crowning you the homecoming queen. Wow, that just gets me right at, at my heart to see that someone would think that much of someone else, not focused on themselves. Oh, look, I won the award. Look how great I am. But instead showed such character and grace to say, I want to bless someone else. That's a courageous act, my friends, the kind of acts that believers in Christ, when they let the Holy Spirit direct them to make those kind of things happen, you can change the world. You can change your community. You can change your church. You can change your family. Stand up this week and be courageous. You know why? Yeah, you're going to have sorrows. You're going to have difficulties. And in the midst of some of the most difficult things that can happen to us, like losing a spouse, losing a mom, there are those that can step up and step in and make the difference. And when you do that in Jesus' name, you have an eternal impact on the lives of others. What are you going to do this week? Are you going to let your sorrows get you down, destroy you? Are you going to let the devil win? Are you going to stand up with Jesus and be courageous? If you will, I promise you, my friends, he, as he always has, will turn your sorrow into joy. God bless you. Thanks for spending some time with me today with the message from First Baptist Church in Winsboro, South Carolina. Join me tomorrow morning 
First thing in the morning on Rumble or YouTube as we wake up in God's Word. A short devotional about 10 minutes every day to get your day started so that you and I can be courageous in our walk with Him. I'll see you then.